Hello, and welcome to the Kathleen Spracklin Podcast. I am a woman on a mission to gather a cadre of writers, thinkers, and teachers who are transforming the world one character at a time. And it all starts with one thing, a deep understanding of human motivation, why people do what they do, and the forces that drive them. But I'm still on my Zellcaston side. Note and... I'm keeping a promise today. Yesterday, I talked about pre-reading, an example of a book by uh, Dr. Carmen Simone, Made You Look, and uh, the book turned out to not be super relevant to my area of interest, but I thought it would be interesting to take a look at it. Uh, Yesterday, I showed how I set up my bib cards and how I used pre-reading to determine my reasons for reading the book, because only after I had done the pre-reading would I know what to expect to get out of it. So today I'm going to take a look at a day's worth of pre-reading, well actually an hour and a half, not a day, um, and go through, Did I was I able to achieve through reading the introduction in chapter one, how did I do with my objectives, did I stay on my objectives or did I wander? And did the book uh, give me what I had hoped to give from it? And then what came out of it, if anything, in the way of a main card? So I'm going to switch over to the down facing camera and I will basically complete the topic that I began yesterday. See you over on the desktop. Okay, here we are on the desktop with the book Made You Look by Carmen Simone. And yesterday I was able to determine that my goals in reading this book, even though it wasn't directly related to my field, was to see if I could capture references to advances in neuroscience regarding attention, and to see if I could pick up on techniques that might be applicable to implementation in text writing as opposed to visual. As it turns out, when I ordered the book, I was very drawn to the subtitle, How to Use Brain Science to Attract Attention and Persuade Others. And I didn't pay sufficient attention to the main title, Made You Look. And of course, the book, as it turns out, is mostly about visual presentations. Nevertheless, upon pre-reading, I was very impressed with the very large section of references, thought that might be quite helpful. And I thought I could pick up some techniques that I could bring over into specifically fiction writing regarding keeping the attention of my reader. Well, regarding the references, that turned out to be a disappointment. Um, The references section is huge and detailed, and I saw a number of things that attracted my attention and articles that just based on the title could easily have me running off to read them. But what I noticed was when I actually read chapter one and I came to a piece of information that I was interested in getting the reference for, I find out that the references are actually listed in alphabetical order and there's no direct tie between the claims made in the text of the book and the reference from which they're drawn. So without playing guessing games, I was was not able to achieve what I wanted to achieve from the references. That said, I did make quite a number of bit notes. So my goal was to pick up on techniques applicable to implementation in text. And this, I read the introduction and chapter one. I got as far as page, as far as page 45. Now, the challenge that I ran into is that I tended to get a little bit lost in the reading of the book and got a little too detailed in my notes. That's a common failing that I have. So I took some rather detailed notes. Here's notes from page seven to 12. Um, I didn't find anything applicable to making a main card out of it. Similarly, on the next card, which covered up to page 32, and here's that quadrant chart that she uses to organize her book. And that's interesting, and I'll come back to it. But again, nothing really 
that could I made a main card out of. The closest thing was this rather interesting one. At the introduction to chapter one, she throws in a bullet point, and it's offering just the right amount of wrong. But when you get into the chapter, what you find out is that it's a very interesting story about someone who decided they wanted to kidnap Dolly, the first cloned sheep. And they succeeded in breaking into the pen where the animal was kept, but it, Dolly wasn't the only sheep there. The pen was full of sheep and they had no idea, the proposed kidnappers had no idea which one was Dolly and they gave up on their attempt to kidnap the sheep. So this was obviously not an example of just the right amount of wrong, but they concluded the Dolly story by saying, well, now if one of the sheep was black, it would have drawn your attention immediately. Okay, but it didn't really give me anything that I could take with me into my work for fiction writing. However, the key thing came in on the third card. And this third card was on semantic priming. And that caught my, really did uh, seem very relevant because of course semantics is, as even as they say, it's an appeal to cognition and it's the meaning of the content. And certainly semantic priming is definitely something that you could do in fiction writing. They, uh, the author, Carmen, makes the point that semantic priming works because we store knowledge in our brains via association. Of course, I've, that's something that I utilize all the time with my character traits, but I was very interested to get a recent reference, and that's where I found the reference is disappointing. I could not pick out a reference that went with this one. Carmen goes on to say that this is useful because when you make con a concept easy and quick to understand, you free up the other attention resources of your audience. And I thought that was rather interesting, but it occurred to me that maybe it would be more valuable to leave a gap that the, that the audience could promptly fill. And by leaving that gap, when they got the gap, when they filled the gap through their own reasoning, they would have a pop of energy and that would be give them reinforcement and help connect them uh, to the material and their understanding. And sure enough, that's what she gets around to saying on page 41. So I was just a little bit ahead of her in thinking, but nevertheless, this concept of semantic priming did seem to me to be the most interesting point that was actually worthy of a main card. So this is the main card that I made for it. I'm going to hide the first two lines because what I want to focus on initially is what I got out of the book and what my response was. Don't pay any attention to the bottom section for a moment either. So what I got from the text from uh, Carmen Simone was that semantic priming sets up an associated word ahead of a word you want them to pay attention to. And, and it's a direct appeal, she says, to cognition. Okay, so, but the key thing for me was picking up on the concept, the, the term semantic priming, which I did not have in my uh, technology, my set of terms. So I concluded with my own thoughts that in fiction, if you want the reader to pick up on an important clue, then first provide some less important words to set the scene so that the reader is already visualizing the space, so that they're ready for the information. So you wouldn't want to start, if you're going to hide something in a flower bed and have the detective discover it, then you probably want to first have him walking down the garden path so that your reader will be already picturing flower beds. So then after having decided on using that information, capturing that information and my reaction to it, then my memory prompt phrase that picks up on the whole card was for me to say, semantic priming sets the scene first, then key info. And that's how I captured it. And I underlined semantic priming because that's my new phrase and scene first because 
if I'm trying to get back into this card and I'm not remembering the word semantic priming, I'll probably remember the scene with the flower bed that was in my mind and I'd be likely to look up scene. Probably, I might not end up actually even indexing the keyword first. I mean, I probably wouldn't think of that word to look it up by. So then when it comes to, well, where do I want to associate this card in my Zettelkasten, I know I don't have semantic priming. It's a new term. And scene doesn't really seem like the, what I want to try to connect this card to. So I looked up a number of words. I looked up words like focus, attention, learning, memory, association, quite a number of words. And I narrowed it down to two cards that might be a good parent and a whole section. Well, that took me a lot of time too, because it just seemed like this one would have the, the ideal parent card. And, but I went through the whole thing and I did not find anything that was quite as good as this first one. Focus, what connects, what conditions, and how are they coordinated? And I thought, wow, that really is a tie-in to this card because this card is all about setting up an associated word ahead of the keyword you want them to know about. So I pulled that card and it didn't have any 4B1 after it. So now I knew what my new card number was. It would be 3B2A 4B1 you know, by the effortless numbering system. And I took a look at this card, which was really quite interesting. I'm not surprised that it's by Sertelanges. I made more main cards from Sertelanges than any other offer. And he has sprinkled throughout my Zettelkast. And I, I, I spot him all the time. So this particular card says to look always for what connects this thing with that. What conditions are necessary for this and for that. Let the coordination and not the scattered fragments fix itself in your memory. And for me, this was before three by five cards. I didn't yet have the concept that I had to add something of my own, but I did have my memory prompt phrase, focus, what connects, what conditions, and how are they coordinated? And I think that's a wonderful place for this card. Now I have two more steps left to do to complete it. One will be to take semantic uh, priming and scene and put this whole phrase under those three headings in my index. And the other thing that I do is over on my bib card where I'm going to transfer right here, the one that I actually made into a main note. I indicate that on my bib card with the red underline and then I'll put the address of the card that, that it went to, 3B2A-4B1. So now I know when I go to my bib card that this one actually made it to a main card. And likewise, if I'm reading this card, I have here in my reference what bib card it was that made this one up, and then I include the page number page 36. So now this card points here and this points back here and the two can connect. So if I ever go back here and I want to learn what note was it, I'll know immediately it's this note here. Okay, so I, there's one other thing on this card that I don't always do, but sometimes I do do it. And when I do it, it's, it's almost magical. It's another note. This note I added after identifying this card as the parent. These cards are, are associated, but this does not develop this idea. They're not, they're, they're close enough to be a really interesting conversation underway here, but they're not like um, directly, you know, one isn't actually the expansion of another idea. So what I added to this card was the note of why it was that this card felt that this card would be the best parent. And that's what I call an association note. I don't always include them, 
But here's my association note for this card. The creator of the material can set forth key connections within the work, like Carmen Simone suggests you do. But an analog Zettelkasten can do the same thing between different works. You can start, now I can start asking myself the questions that this card proposes. Oh, what connects the, the semantic priming with the key info? What conditions does the semantic priming do for the key info? How are they coordinated? You can see how, how deeply associated these two cards are. And this is, this is the kind of thing that when you take the time and when you, when you deliberately take the time to do all of this positioning choice, and now when I do that one extra step of four, three or four times, I'm going to be writing out semantic priming sets the scene first, then the key info over and over. And each time I write it, I'm reminding myself of this entire card because that's what this phrase is supposed to do. It's like if you were in a play and you were trying to remember your lines and there was a guy over in the wings whispering a prompt. He wouldn't tell you your whole line. He'd give you your prompt. And so when I write this prompt line in my index under semantic, again under priming, again under scene, I'm, each time I'm trying to remember the whole card. And when you do that, you're sending just ripples of delight over into your subconscious mind, which delights in doing nothing more than establishing connections, coordinations, determining conditions. Isn't that sweet? What's happening in your brain is exactly what's being described on this card. To me, that would give me enough energy. I know I'm 10 minutes past my normal time to turn in, I could go another hour just from the energy pop that I got from filing this card. So I probably won't go any deeper in this book right now because it isn't super uh, associated with what I'm doing. But another beautiful thing about the bib card is I can put a little bookmark in this book. And if I come back to it, I can very quickly pull up my bib cards, continue reading, continue making notes, maybe make an additional main card. If I wanted to know where I left off in the book and what was the author saying, I have enough information on these bib cards that I can just read through them very quickly and I'm immediately connected back with where I left off in the book, even if it sits for three or four months before I get back to it. So I hope you enjoyed this. To me, it's uh, it's part of why an analog Zettelkasten just fills me with so much delight and energy and why I am so happy to share it with you. So if you want me to continue, just keep telling me how you're using it. Keep asking your questions because that's what fuels my motivation is seeing you get your Zettelkasten up and running. In that regard, you might want to check also the um, notes, the show notes, because I'm planning a course, which at the end of it, if it, uh, you'll start from wherever you are in your Zettelkasten, and by the end, you'll have a fully functioning Zettelkasten that suits you. So if you're interested in the idea of a course like that, I'm taking it kind of like an early bird sign up where I'll keep you noticed, notified every Thursday, I'll be sending out an email on how the design of the course is coming. So if that's something that interests you, uh, check out the show notes. Um, you can find it under kathleensprockman.com forward slash ZK dash dream. And it's also in the show notes. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.